I mainly focus on cancer, but what I wanted to talk about more today was the epidemiology background I have and some of our methods work that we've been doing to evaluate different collection methods and different uh, samples that should be included in uh, larger population studies. Um, but before I start, uh, this Helicobacter pylori is the primary etiologic agent for gastric cancer. It's the first bacteria that was determined to cause cancer. And this has kind of served as the basis for our group to study the microbiome. However, going forward, we don't believe that there's gonna be another single bacteria, single cancer outcome. So we're trying to develop um, different methods to be able to look more at the community structure versus single bacteria. Uh, currently, there's been a number of studies that have looked at mainly oral and fecal samples that have found that uh, the microbiome is associated with a number of different cancers, uh, including colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer. Uh, Gary Wu yesterday spoke a little bit about how it could be related to hepatobiliary cancers, etc. Um, however, in a lot of these studies, replication has been a bit of an issue. and. Um, you know, some of this could be due to different methods that have been used in the different studies. In addition, almost all of the studies that have been published to date are all case control studies, so that means that the samples were collected at the time of cancer diagnosis, and it's unclear then if the microbiome actually influenced the risk of cancer or if the cancer actually changed the microbiome. So for that reason, uh, we've been working on different methods to try and evaluate now the more prospective association between the microbiome and cancer. And so some of our priorities of our group have been first to evaluate different collection methods because in a large epidemiological study, you might have 50,000, 100,000 participants in your study. And for a fecal sample, for example, it's really difficult to get someone to come to the clinic and have a bowel movement for you. So you need to find a method where the person can collect it at home and may not have to have dry ice. They can keep it at room temperature for a little while, maybe send it in the mail. So the idea is we wanna find a method that will preserve this microbial signature in suboptimal storage conditions like room temperature. Also, we want to evaluate methods that are optimized for different t technologies. Yesterday in the keynote lecture, we heard about you know, 16S and whole genome shotgun metagenomics and also metabolomics. And ideally, we can get collection methods that can kind of do the whole spectrum. And then also, we, we've been looking at different quality control standards to evaluate reproducibility. Um, you know, the replication issue, maybe some of this is because you know, there's different quality control issues. And then finally, it's really important to start collecting these new samples in order to study incident disease so that we're not only studying uh, a prevalent disease. So my outline for my presentation today is I'd first like to talk about the different collection methods that we've investigated for microbiome studies, then some of our work with quality control samples, and then going forward, the development of new population-based studies. Uh, so we've evaluated a couple of, fec of, of fecal collection for use, for use in 16S RNA gene sequencing studies. Uh, the first study was published a little while ago in CEBP, and um, you can take a look if you're interested. We did find some methods that were really suboptimal, and these were then in excluded in our second study, which we called Mayo 2. These were both conducted at Mayo Clinic. Um, and in this study, we had 53 individuals. We collected fecal and oral samples. And then using all of the different collection methods, we either froze them immediately or left them at room temperature for four days and then froze them in order to compare the temporal stability. So these were the five different collection methods that we used in the study. We looked at um, uh, samples with no solution, samples preserved in RNA later, those preserved in 95% ethanol. As a note, in the original Mayo 1 study, we used 70% ethanol, and that didn't look good at room temperature over the course of four days, so that was excluded, and we decided to test 95% ethanol instead. Then we used FOBT cards. These are commonly used in uh, colorectal cancer screening studies. In the original Mayo 1 study, we also tested 
uh, using uh, actually testing the samples for fecal occult blood, and that didn't appear to disrupt the microbiome. So in this study, we, we did um, process them all. And then finally, fit tubes, which are also used for colorectal cancer screening. Um, all of these samples, except for the no solution, were some aliquots were frozen immediately, and then other aliquots were left at room temperature for four days. The no solution samples were not left at room temperature for four days because it didn't look good in the original study, and we then used those samples just to be considered our gold standard of what you know maybe you think that the microbiome actually you know represented at the time. And then when we, to evaluate these samples, we first looked at technical reproducibility. This was looking at just replicates at the same time point to just see two samples from, or two aliquots from the same sample, how similar those are if they're treated exactly the same way. Then we looked at stability. We wanted to compare those samples that were left at room temperature for four days and frozen to the ones that were immediately frozen to see how leaving them at room temperature would affect the sample. And then finally, we calculated accuracy, where we compared these samples to the gold standard, which, as I mentioned, was the fecal sample that had no additive and was frozen immediately. And then these are the characteristics we looked at. We looked at the relative abundance of three different phyla. We looked at two different measures of alpha diversity. And then we looked at the first principal coordinate of unweighted, generalized, and weighted unifrac, and also the Bray-Curtis distance. And then for our analysis, we calculated interclass correlation coefficients, and this basically compares the variability within a subject to the variability across subjects. So this is kind of looking at you know, inter-individual variability or intra-individual variability to just see for within each person how different the samples are. Um, and then we also, for, for accuracy, looked at the Spearman correlation coefficient, which is a non-parametric test, and this actually just compares the rank order. So, for example, if someone in one method had a high, had a high number of OTUs, are they consistently high? So it's not the actual value of OTUs, it's, it's a rank within the other participants. So to start, we looked just at the overall variability explained, so to look at if the differences seen in the microbiome were due to subject treatment, so collection method, or the day of freezing. And as you can see here, um, the percent variability explained is, is mainly due to the subject. So basically, the biggest difference in the microbiome was due to the, just the differences between subjects. Now, to orient you to these graphs, I'm going to have a couple of these, but these are ICCs, and ideally your ICC is at one. So that means that it's almost exactly the same. And when we're looking at technical reproducibility, these really do look very good. You know, so for all of the different collection methods, you can see that they're all very close to one, which means that four samples collected in the exact same way from the exact same sample, they look very similar, which is a very good sign. So that means, you know, taking just one aliquot may be sufficient. Now, when we look at stability, some of these ICCs do decrease a bit. They're not as close to one as we would like, um, particularly for the 95% ethanol. As you can see here, the pink bars, they get a little lower. But you'll notice that the 95% ethanol is really only lower for measures that take into account um, relative abundance, so weighted unifrac and then the relative abundance of the three phyla. So it's, it's possible that it's just slightly disrupting uh, some of the uh, OTUs and then causing a change in these relative abundance since they're dependent on the relative levels. But in general, still, these, all of these methods appear fairly stable, which is, is comforting if you're going to collect some samples and want to leave them at room temperature for a short time when you get them to a clinic or to a freezer. And then when we look at accuracy, so this is, again, this is comparing each sample collection method to the immediately frozen fecal sample. And these ICCs got a little bit lower again, too. Um, so you can see, especially for the relative abundance, relative abundances again, these ICCs got quite a bit lower. And again, the weighted unifrac also was a bit lower. Um, and, you know, so this is kind of showing that each method is slightly different from the immediately frozen fecal sample. 
which in general really suggests that in any study that's designed, you want to collect your samples in the same way. You can use multiple methods, but when you're doing the comparisons, it's ideal to be using the same collection method. So, because you know, if, if you observe differences, it could be actually related to collection method versus the um, actual biological differences. When we use the Spearman correlation, it does look like they, it does a better job of keeping the rank order of people. So it looks like someone that has you know, a low relative abundance of Firmicutes is going to have a low relative abundance in both collection methods. Um, so the Spearman correlation does show stronger, IC, or stronger correlations. So in general, it looks like the inter-individual variability was really the biggest difference here. So the collection method didn't play as big of a role and the freezing time point didn't play as big of a role. Um, all of the methods did appear to be reproducible, stable, and relatively accurate. And we believe that future studies could use any of the methods for 16S RNA gene analysis. However, as I said as the caveat, it's important that all of the comparisons are made within method since it does appear that each method does have its own type of bias. We also in that study looked at oral collection methods. This uh, study is still in progress, so I'm not going to present any results. but. Just so you know, the OmniGene Discover Kit and Scope mouthwash were both adequate for microbiome uh, measurements, and they also seem to show a difference between the two. So the OmniGene Discover Kit did appear to be different from the Scope mouthwash, but that's not necessarily unexpected because when we did the Scope mouthwash, it was a swish and a gargle, which meant that they're likely collecting microbes from other parts of the mouth. Um, so then we wanted to also look at fecal metabolomics to look within these same collection methods whether you could actually conduct metabolomic analyses. Um, of the collection methods I mentioned earlier, the RNA later was unable to be used for metabolomics, so that was excluded from this study. So we looked at the immediately frozen fecal samples, the um, samples that were immediately frozen and left at four for four days at room temperature and 95% ethanol with the FOBT cards and the FIT tubes. So using the same metrics for the metabolomic study, we looked at technical reproducibility first. And this is, again, comparing those replicates that were collected in the exact same way. The first thing I'll have you notice here is the immediately frozen fecal samples with no solution had the highest number of metabolites. So 625 metabolites were detected in no solution. Uh, ethanol had the second highest uh, number of metabolites with 508. The FOBT cards had slightly lower number of metabolites. And the FIT tube really had the lowest number of metabolites. In general, though, for technical reproducibility, these samples look to be pretty similar. Um, so it looks like it would, you know, that one, again, one sample should be sufficient. Um, but when, it looks, when we looked at stability, so these, this is again looking at a sample left out at room temperature for four days and, another, and the other sample frozen immediately within the same individual, the only two samples that appeared to be very stable were the samples preserved in 95% ethanol and those on, using the FOBT card. The FIT tube, didn't, different metabolites had different ICCs, but it's pretty variable. It didn't look like in the FIT tubes the metabolites were very stable. And then for accuracy, um, the 95% ethanol and the FOBT cards appeared more similar to the immediately frozen samples with no um, preservative. And the FIT tube, again, it, it didn't quite look as, as similar to the um, no preservative sample. So in summary for this study, it looked like 95% ethanol and FOBT cards were relatively reproducible, stable, and accurate compared to that, our gold standard sample. Uh, the FIT tubes perform less well for untargeted metabolomics. And the immediately frozen no additive fecal sample had high detectability and the highest estimates of technical reproducibility. So highest detectability meaning the most metabolites detected. And, but 95% ethanol also had a very high number. And so we, we suggest that new studies that need to leave their samples at room temperature should preferably use 95% ethanol or FOBT cards for their studies since they're good for both 16S RNA gene sequencing and untargeted metabolomics. Now I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the QC sample generation that we've done. Um, we were a part of a, a large study within the U U.S. looking at um, handling and bioinformatics on, on microbiome 
uh, results. And two of the samples we generated for this study were um, artificial mock communities and a robo-gut samples. So for the artificial communities, we worked with the lab of Emma Allen Verco in, um, in Guel the University of Guelph, and she generated an oral artificial community which contained 22 oral bacteria that were mixed in fixed ratios that then could be included on every plate to see if the, each lab was able to actually extract and detect all 22 species, and then also to look at the relative levels. We also generated uh, samples that had 20 species from the gut, and then in uh, Emma's lab, she has what's called a robo-gut, which is featured here, where basically it's feeded with a fecal sample, and then it can generate large quantities of a homogenous sample. So then this sample can also be included on all the plates, and although we don't know exactly what's in it, it's going to be uh, the same. Um, so we use this sample also in a small DNA extraction pilot in our lab. And it's not really important what anything actually is on this, on this slide except for the artificial communities. But basically, we were just testing four different DNA extraction methods on oral samples, lots of different types of oral samples. And we wanted to see what would be the best extraction method for our lab. And you can see here, these are pretty much all the oral samples up here. But then there's a small little cluster of other samples there in the corner, and those are our artificial communities. And we could then look closer at the artificial communities, and we could see each color here on this PicoA plot is a different DNA extraction method. But you, we could see that two of the DNA extraction methods appeared very similar to each other. And then two methods seemed to have some kind of bias, or just they were doing something different with, with the um, artificial communities. But then we were also able to go into the data and make sure that the method that we chose was actually extracting all of the 22 oral bacteria that were included in, in that uh, sequencing run. So that was the way that we were able to determine what method we're using in our lab. And then in the microbiome quality control project, we also then were able to look at different labs and to see how many of the reads that they generated from those artificial communities exactly map to the bacteria that were included in that artificial community because we knew, given that 16S variable region, what the exact read could be. And we could then also look at, you know, one base pair different, two base pairs different, and, um, you know, kind of just evaluate uh, the, the methods that were used in the different labs. And then also, we've uh, conducted a, a large study of oral wash samples using um, NHANES, and we included these quality control samples on all the plates. And you can kind of then go and look through and see which plates may look a little different. You can do the exact read analysis. You can make sure that all the different bacteria are, um, are in there. And we found, you know, just, just by looking at this, you know, these relative abundances, that there were some plates that had some real problems given that this was so different from the others. And we just reran those plates to make sure that everything was, was looking better. So in summary for this, QC samples are really important for epidemiologic studies. The, by using these, these samples, you can look for batch effects, and hopefully if the statistical methods are developed, there may be an ability to use these quality control samples to help with data pooling, potentially to adjust different plates so that they can be pooled in the same way. Um, that's very much above my pay grade, but you know, it's something that, you know, going forward could be something very interesting to be able to pool data that were from samples that were extracted at very different times or sequenced at, at different centers. There's also still a need for a more complex known QC sample that's in the proper matrix. So these artificial communities are not, you know, not like a fecal sample. Um, and the idea, the ideal would be to have something more like this robo-gut sample that is the proper matrix, but you also know exactly what's in it, so you can really evaluate the method. Okay, so finally, I would just want to conclude with talking about developing new population studies. Um, Jim Geddert, who recently retired from our division, he published a paper a couple years ago just talking about some of the important considerations for new microbiome studies. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail. It's, it's in the paper, too. But, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to go into a study before you start collecting samples um, to make sure that, you know, especially that you have the appropriate controls 
that you're collecting the samples in the same way. You know, if the cases and the controls are collected in two different ways, you're, you're most likely going to see a case control difference, but it could be purely due to the collection method. Um, it, you know, it's important to determine what, what type of sample is going to be collected and how many samples from each person and what they're going to be stabilized in. Also, all of the different um, processes for handling the samples, um, you know, from, from the microbiome quality control project, it looks like there is a fairly large effect of um, DNA extraction on the, um, on the microbiome findings. And, you know, so that would, it's important that at least for within each study that the samples are extracted in the same way. Because again, if cases are extracted one way and controls are extracted another way, you can't necessarily know if it's the extraction method or a case control difference. And then also getting all of the information on key confounders. Um, you know, a number of the speakers yesterday were talking about a lot of these things, like Gary Wu was discussing how diet affects the microbiome and how it's important to also look at that and make sure that you're adjusting for the appropriate confounders. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the, the ideal study that we're trying to plan um, would be a prospective cohort study where you collect samples at a baseline time point, whether it be a healthy time point or you know, when someone's diagnosed with a certain disease, but you collect all the samples then, get questionnaire, get data, get all of the information on the people, and then you can start to follow them up. So if, you know, in, in our context at the National Cancer Institute, we follow people and if they develop cancer, then that's their outcome. You know, and other people may go all the way through follow-up and never develop disease, and others may die during follow-up. But you, you have this information all at baseline for these people to see if these microbial characteristics are associated then with incident disease. Um, and potentially collecting more samples, more questionnaires, you know, it depends on, on most people's funding whether they can recontact participants. But, you know, the more information always feels like the better. Um, so, you know, like I just kind of mentioned the figure, you know, at the baseline collection, you, you get specimens, you get, have a comprehensive questionnaire. At follow-ups, you can collect additional samples, get additional questionnaires, and then during the follow-up, uh, we often identify our endpoints using the cancer registry and the National Death Index. And then because of cost, we often will conduct what's called a nested case control study once we have sufficient cases accrued. So we can use all of the incident cases and then have a, a subset of our, of our uh, cohort to use as the controls in that study. But one of the key components when, when designing one of these studies is trying to figure out how many samples per person are needed. And some of this can be determined looking at the temporal variation in the samples. So if one sample isn't necessarily representative of a typical you know, gut microbiome, then that one sample isn't as powerful as maybe having more. So we did a study looking at the temporal variation in fecal samples, and in this study we used some data from NCI, a study conducted in Costa Rica, and the HMP. And these, we, oops, we used um, two different samples separated by about six months in almost all cases to see how stable these different metrics were over those six months. And you can see, again, ICC of one is ideal, that these are, the different metrics have different ICCs, so you know these these different metrics are not necessarily very stable over time, and so collecting one sample to look at an incident outcome will then require larger sample sizes. So this is a little complicated, but basically I just took the ICC from the Chow One estimate, which was 0.44, and then we con we conducted a, a calculation to determine how many uh, participants you would need for a given number of specimens based on the effect size that you, you hypothesize will occur. So an effect size of 0.5 means that there's going to be a very strong, you hypothesize there's going to be a very strong association between the microbiome and a certain outcome. So if you have, you hypothesize it's going to be a very strong association and you only collect one specimen, you're probably only going to need about 493 people in your study to detect that large of an association. However, if it's a much weaker effect, so you think it's going to be, you know, a very low relative risk or a, a not strong relative risk between the microbiome and your outcome, with one specimen, you're now going to need over 12,000 participants to detect an association. And this changes then based on how many specimens you have. The more specimens you have, the um, fewer 
fewer participants you'll need. Um, and this then varies also by the different metric that you're looking at. So I just presented the Chow One estimate, but there's, um, we, in a paper that's currently in preparation, we have estimates for all of the different ICCs that were estimated or generated from our study. So overall, I am concluding from this presentation, many of the collection methods, there's many collection methods that are available for fecal samples. However, we think more work is needed for other omic technology, whole genomes, shotgun metagenomics, proteomics, et cetera. And we also need more work on different sample types, so it depends on your hypothesis of your study. It's also really important to develop QC samples for inclusion in these studies. Hopefully in the future, we can use these QCs to help combine and pool data. And then finally, it's really important to collect new samples for prospective microbiome studies in order to look at the impact of the microbiome on health and disease, since, as I mentioned at the very beginning, these case control studies can't tell if it's the microbiome actually impacting the disease or if the microbiomes change due to the disease. So I have enough, this work has been conducted with a number of people throughout the NCI and also externally. So um, I'd like to thank all of these people for their help and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.